Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. What explains the bipartisan commitment to unending wars and foreign military interventions? Recent polls show the majority of veterans who fought in this century's foreign wars say it wasn't worth it. In 2016, Trump gained traction for doubting foreign adventures. Today, Tulsi Gabbard is doing the same. Why are the elites so out of touch? Cross-talking unending wars, I'm joined by my guest, Daniel Shaw in New York. He is a professor of Latin American and Caribbean studies at City University of New York. In Bethesda, we have Peter Kuznick. He is a professor of history and director of the Nuclear Studies Institute at American University, as well as co-author with Oliver Stone of The Untold History of the United States. And in Washington, we cross to Lee Camp. He is the host and head writer of the comedy news show, Redacted Tonight on RT America. All right, gentlemen. Crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I always appreciate it. Let's go to Bethesda. Peter, I think that all of us would agree, and our audience, that it, it's unlikely that we would ever compare Tulsi Gabbard and Donald Trump, okay? They're, they're very, very different, but they do have one commonality, and it's an attitude towards foreign adventures. Now, Donald Trump has not been able to do much about his uh, rhetoric of the campaign while he's been in office, but Tulsi Gabbard keeps going. Both of them are sh um, slammed every time they go outside the, 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 the borders uh, or the, um, the, the perimeters of the bipartisan commitment to these wars. Why is it, why do they get slammed down so hard, so fast, even with people within their own party? Go ahead, Peter. <clears throat> well, as you indicate, there's a broad bipartisan consensus when it comes to American foreign policy. And it's uh, dominated by a neocon, neoconservative worldview. It's based on this idea of American exceptionalism, that the United States has the right, the duty, the obligation to intervene around the world, that the United States is God's gift to humanity, that unlike everybody else, we're altruistic and benevolent. We want to spread freedom and democracy. But the net result of this is that we live in a world in which the richest eight people have more wealth than the poorest 3.8 billion people. That U.S. policy has been a consistently interventionist one, that uh, the Cold War never really ended. Mm -hmm. The policy did not change at the end of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And there's been a war, a war between the first world and the third world ever since. But it's very, very dangerous. Tulsi understands that. I don't agree that Donald Trump and Tulsi are in any way comparable. Uh, Tulsi's views on foreign policy are so much better informed than Donald Trump's. Well, that's for sure. Donald Trump, that's for Donald sure. Donald Trump's record is actually very hawkish, very militaristic. So even though he has a rhetoric about not wanting to intervene, it's very, very different than the kind of progressive, intelligent worldview sure. in which one is opposed to this. Okay, in a very well, well, I agree with you completely. My point is, for example, uh, removing troops from Syria and you know even his own uh, government, his own cabinet, uh, you know, came piling. And I, I take your point, well taken here, Daniel. Let me go to to you. In my introduction, also I mentioned that recent polling, because of Memorial Day, um, the veterans of these wars in this century, these interventionist wars, they say the majority. A large majority actually say, it, quote unquote, it wasn't worth it. So that should be kind of some wake up call, wouldn't you think? Go ahead, Daniel. One would certainly hope, but the foreign policy establishment, the, the Pentagon, uh, has never listened to the veterans or listened to anybody except for their own narrow interests. Uh, of course, the Vietnam era veterans still suffering to this day from PTSD and thousands upon thousands, um, tens of thousands of our loved ones, sisters and brothers sent to Iraq and Afghanistan in these wars of foreign pillage. Uh, no question that these veterans are against the war and Tulsi Gabbard very articulately uh, captures that sentiment. And she's really a fresh of breath air in these mm -hmm. stale uh, Democratic Party debates when no one besides Bernie is willing to take on the foreign policy establishment. And here you have a very unique individual with 16 years of quote unquote service, one might say disservice, if one agrees with Martin Luther King that the U.S. government and the U.S. military are the greatest purveyors of violence in the world. But she speaks a certain language and can go on Fox News yeah. and can relate to really uh, millions of American families. And they're afraid of, they're very definitively afraid of her. 
Yeah, they, they really are. And it is really quite interesting um, that she has a place at, at Fox News. Who, who would have thought? Anyway, let me go to Lee here in Washington. You know, Lee, from everything we've heard so far on this program here, I, I suppose is that the, uh, the democratic process and, and having popular opinion about f uh, foreign policy is just simply verboten, okay? You can argue about everything else, but you can't argue about foreign policy. It just isn't there. And, it, and one of the reasons why it's there is because the corporate mainstream media gives this bipartisan view cover all of the time. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 totally disgusting that we live in largely a death economy. I mean, we make tremendous amounts of money from our weapons sales. Fifty-five percent of our discretionary spending is dumped into the military. And if anyone questions it, it's it, they're they're called right. Hillary Clinton called Tulsi Gabbard a Russian asset. It is completely not allowed to question our uh, military-industrial complex. And if you are, you are pushed out by the two corporate parties. You are you are purged from. The them like something they needed to vomit up because you dared question these things. And as you mentioned earlier, in the few instances that Donald Trump has tried to do something that was against war, against death, against our military, such as withdraw troops or peace with North Korea, he is shut down. And, you know, that is not to say he's some kind of dove. Uh, what was it? Obama dropped 26,000 drone bombs his final year in office. And with, under Trump, it went up to 40,000 a year. So he is no dove. It's a bomb every 12 minutes. You know, there's blood on all of our hands as Americans. And uh, but in those few instances where he does seem like he has some desire to create peace or to limit war, he is completely shut down. And it raises the question, have we seen basically a, a soft coup in terms of yeah. foreign policy? If it's okay. completely run by our military industrial complex and you cannot question it, even if you're the pres president of the United States, then who's in control of it? It's yeah, not well, the president. It's not Congress. Well, Peter, as we heard a few weeks ago from a former uh, deputy director of the CIA, thank God for the deep state, okay? Um, and everybody clapped, okay? Peter, saying with you, okay, given everything we've said here on this program, but if we look at these interventions, particularly since um, uh, in this century, they all have been utter failures. So there's no learning curve on top of this bipartisan commitment to unending wars. So they, they, they can't even acknowledge failure. Is that, that's even worse. Go ahead, Peter. Well, we've had some some stunning successes. We did be, defeat several dozen Cuban construction workers in Grenada in 1983. Um, <laughs> but uh, our military record since, since Vietnam, or really going back since the Korean War, I mean, how much more do we have to learn? There was just a big conference last week in Washington about the Vietnam War. You know, and, and it's the worst atrocity since the Holocaust. 3.8 million Vietnamese died, according to Robert McNamara when he came into my class. He said he accepts that 3.8 million Vietnamese died. But if we look at the track record since then, there's been military intervention after military intervention uh, with dismal results, creating more problems, not only killing millions of people, but uh, wreaking havoc. Uh, the, uh, many of the problems that we're facing in the world now are a result of the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003. And people warned beforehand that that would be the effect. Oh, yeah. But, it, yep. but again, the media did not allow that, that point of view. The only one who was uh, talking about that, Phil Donahue, And he was lost his job. Yeah, and he lost his job. And the NBC officials said, well, everybody else is waving the flag. We don't want to be seen as some kind of doves over here. But there's then been that dangerous kind of consensus. You turn on uh, CNN or MSNBC. I mean, Fox News is absurd. But you turn on CNN and MSNBC, and you'll have four uh, talking heads there who are experts saying that the Russian intervention in the 2016 election was an act of war. And nobody even thinks to raise any of the history. Well, okay, Peter. I was kind of hoping to avoid the impeachment thing, but you opened that can of worms. So I'm going to go to Daniel. You know, Daniel, I've been watching uh, part of some of the hearings because they're so absurd and they're so boring and they're so opaque. Um, uh, it, it, it is really just a, 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 a sick show to watch. But, okay, given that, I watched the quote-unquote experts on Ukraine. Why do they have their jobs? They have no idea what they're talking about. And then to kind of add on what Peter was saying, 
the media just says, oh my goodness, these patriots are so knowledgeable, you have to defer to them, their, their expertise. No, they're not. They're all political hacks. Daniel. Yeah, the impeachment proceedings, as the other guests have said, are a massive distraction from the very real issues. I'm in New York City right now. Every day, more poverty and, and homelessness, the opioid epidemic, all these real working class issues that need to be addressed in the media spin doctors 24-7 with every minute, uh, boring detail about Ukraine and all the Russia phobia and Russia gate failed. So now there's this whole Ukraine thing. It's extremely distracting. And what's really behind that is um, Donald Trump is not a reliable, dependable candidate for what you call the deep state, for the Pentagon, That's for true. the State Department. Good point. And of course, he should be impeached. He should be overthrown because he's a racist, warmongering, xenophobic, homophobic, misogynist. Um, but the mainstream media doesn't focus on that. They focus on really these um, uh, deceptive, anti-Russia, hysterical uh, plots that they've concocted. Okay, but, you know, Daniel, last 30 seconds go to you for, before we go to the break. But, but Russiagate was a hoax. It failed. Why, why do they think it's going to get traction if you just put Ukraine in front of it here? I mean, that, it's absurd here. Go 25 seconds, Stu, before we go to the break. Again, it's, uh, it's designed to distract. If the top 10 New York Times stories and Fox stories and CNN and there's this media uh, hegemony, then the everyday American people can't see outside of that box. And the everyday American populace is not educated on U.S. foreign policy. That's, oh, they that's still true. subscribe to this idea of what the professor called American exceptionalism. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to jump in here. We're going to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on unending war. Stay with RT. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter LaBelle. To remind you, we're discussing unending wars. Okay, let's go to Lee in Washington. Um, it's part of my job, Lee, to watch the media as much as painful and stupid and a waste of time as it is. I have to keep up with what other people are saying. Um, I, should, uh, I, should get <laughs> I should get hardship pay because I watch a lot of nonsense, okay? Lee, I want to yeah. pick up on two points that we were brought up in this program, Peter brought up. Um, uh, American exceptionalism here. And Daniel was also talking about how poorly educated Americans are about foreign policy. And I think that's really kind of the nexus because most Americans, maybe through no fault of their own actually, have no idea the impact of American foreign policy around the world. I mean, what's going on in Bolivia right now? It is horrendous what's going on. It, 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 it really, when you look at um, um, uh, opposition figures being kidnapped, being tied to trees, being tortured, um, uh, flaunting every uh, constitutional law there is. and. It's not there. Maybe the gray zone will cover it, the intercept will cover it, and a few other people. You will cover it, Lee, okay? But the American people largely have no idea about these things, and because of what we heard about American exceptional, and that's the bow on the top, isn't it? Where it kind of keeps everything in stasis. Go ahead, Lee. Yeah, I think it's a testament to what a brilliant job they've done. It's shutting down an actual discussion in the media of the truth behind these these coups that we've helped create in uh, in Bolivia right now. With the many of these coup leaders were trained at the School of the Americas, which has been renamed for branding purposes. You know, the brand was getting sullied, so they had to change the name. But uh, you know, and in Venezuela, our economic uh, sanction or economic war has killed forty thousand people over the past. Couple Couple of years and Americans don't know any of this because you're not going to get it really on on just about any mainstream outlet and that includes NPR and uh, PBS and those that that are now you know the head of NPR is the former head of Voice of America so you have a full a, a full scale uh, American propaganda network across all of the outlets and many of the independent outlets so it's really an impressive job they've done at dumbing down the American populace and I do uh, real quick want to take issue with one thing that was said earlier 
earlier. I don't know that all of these uh, wars and invasions that we've been involved in are failures from the view of the neocons and the you know the neoliberals that have run them. I think destroying the country of Iraq and and making it so it basically is is, is powerless. But I think that in no, their view is probably yeah, a success, yeah, probably yeah, similar yeah. with Syria, just seeing them collapse. You yes, know? you're right. Yeah, it's chaos theory. I, I've heard this argument, and I think it has a lot of validity. I'm glad you brought it up. Thanks, Lee. Let me go to Peter now. What, what happened to the anti-war movement? What happened? I mean, I remember the marches all around the world, particularly in Europe, and the protests in the U.S., uh, protesting the Iraq war. It's gone. It's why? Is it because of the media, or is it because of control of the Internet and social media platforms? Well, how do we explain it? Go ahead, Peter. Well, if we had a good answer to that, maybe we could rebuild the anti-war movement. It's not that, you know, I'm on the campuses, and I go around the country speaking quite a bit, uh, and it's not that the young people, that the students don't care. They do care. First of all, they're not very well informed on this issue. They're very mobilized on climate change. They're really activists about that. They're very sensitive to gender and sexual issues of the Me Too movement. They're very concerned about racial issues. But there's very little concern about nuclear issues, number one, and number two, foreign policy in general. And we're talking about you, you introduced Trump as somewhat in a positive way in the beginning. You look at his nuclear policies. That's it's true. an absolute effing disaster. Yep. You know, not only did he uh, uh, pull out of the JCPOA, the nuclear deal with Iran, not only did he I agree. pull out of the INF treaty, I agree. he doesn't want to do the New START treaty. I agree. He wants to push, and you look at his nuclear posture review, he wants to push us back to a nuclear arms race like the 1980s when we had 70,000 nuclear weapons in the world. So, uh, but uh, they're, not, they're not focused on these issues either. So it's not that they don't care, but I think that, and they do have a sense of existential threat, which is why they're concerned about climate change. But some of the other issues, the uh, issues of U.S. unending wars, the issues of nuclear threats, uh, this, it's not on their agenda well, right now. I guess, Peter, I, that, well, I guess with the, you know, you bring up the environment. I suppose your students know that the Pentagon is the biggest polluter in the world, okay? They probably know that, but probably not. The, uh, foreign interventions around the world and how they happened here. Uh, Daniel, the same question to you. I mean, I, I, I'll use um, Peter's. You know, how do we rebuild the anti war movement? I mean, we, we have Code Pink out there. That's great. And I agree with him on those issues here. But, you know, how do you, how do you capitalize on what we had before? Because it's only getting worse. I mean, I think one of the biggest changes in the last couple of years is that you have the neocons invading the left, the liberals now. I mean, now they're in bed, they have equal footing in each part. And you can hear neocon propaganda talking points on the mainstream corporate media 24 7. Okay? I mean, it's just blanket coverage right now. I could, you know, Peter's an expert on, on Vietnam. I mean, it was members of the media that started questioning the war. Nobody in the media, mainstream media, questions it or their silence. Go ahead, Daniel. In the Bush years, we had marches in D.C. and right below me in Times Square of hundreds of thousands of people consistently against George Bush and the war machine. What happened was uh, the Barack Obama effect, an abomination, if you will, a new uh, face of imperialism um, that was able to really fool. So the whole liberal wing of the anti-war movement folded. And suddenly our marches, when Libya was destroyed, bombed to smithereens and recolonized, and we marched here in Times Square and across the country. Our marches went from hundreds of thousands to maybe a hundred, uh, but honestly dozens. And when we stood up for Syria and took an anti-imperialist stance for Syria, who would come into the streets for Syria? We've had marches for uh, Bolivia and for Venezuela, but again, in general, the American public, it's the last thing that they're thinking about. It's the last thing that they're educated on. So really, there's a lot of work in front of us as popular educators to have these conversations, that Venezuela is not the enemy, that Cuba is not the enemy, that our enemy is right here in Washington, D.C., on Wall Street. So uh, I don't want to project any type of cynicism, but we have to continue to have that dialogue to, to educate and build this anti-war movement to what it was in the early years of the invasion and, and occupation of Iraq.
You know, Lee, you know, I, I, I keep covering what's going on in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan because I think it's really important to. But, you know, I have to think twice about doing a program on it because when, like the last couple of programs I did on both countries, I, the questions on YouTube is that what is he talking about? Why are they talking about this? I mean, to, the reason yeah, because nobody. Co I mean, you can go to antiwar.com every day. That's one of the things I do with my morning coffee every single day, and I keep up, you know, incrementally what's going on here. And but I could understand how someone that would just flip on this channel right now and say, "What in the world are they talking about?" You know, because that's that that is really an indictment of the media yeah. because it doesn't have any pedagogical purpose whatsoever. Any more. Go ahead, Lee. Well, and it's even being purged from social media. So even the outside outlets that people used to get that information from are now being purged. You mentioned antiwar.com. I'm pretty sure they're one of the ones that were purged from Facebook and they're, you know, editors purged from Twitter. And, you know, the idea that, that anybody speaking out against war should be uh, eliminated from these social media outlets is uh, it's so disgusting and it's revolting and, and it should infuriate people. And one other thing I want to say about why the, the anti-war movement has been has dwindled so heavily is all of America is told to put our entire energy and anger and frustration and 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 all just funnel it all into the presidential election. Oh, yeah. That is it. That's all that can be talked about. If you are angry about these things, go vote. And it, look, you should vote, but you should vo view voting as picking up a piece of litter. It's a tiny little thing you do to help your society. It is not going to. It's not the. If you're angry about things, you need to get angry beyond just your voting or your arguing about which political candidate. You you know, uh, said something silly the other day. You know, you know, Peter, I think one of the great tragedies, you know, because we've walked away from all of these important arms control agreements, uh, the agreement with Iran on nuclear deal, which I thought Obama was right in doing that. Um, we're all fixed, at least we're told, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a tear a page from uh, Lee right, right now, we're all told to focus this, ourselves on the orange man in the White House. That is the biggest distraction there could possibly be. And I keep telling my viewers, so much is going on in the world right now that you're not paying attention to that are detrimental to everyone involved. But it's just this huge distraction on Donald Trump. And I think that's a huge mistake, but it does work well for the deep state, the intelligence community, because everybody is arguing with each other and they're making their own decisions on their own. Peter. This is like Fahrenheit 451. You know, people have their television walls while the planes are flying off to distant wars and nobody's paying attention. You know, and that's, you know, Donald Trump sucks all the air out of the room. He wants everything to be focused on him, and the media does it. Does it. Uh, and, but, and, and it's, a, I mean, in some ways it's important because he is dangerous, uh, and we do need to get him out of office as quickly as possible. But the other issues that are so important, is there any discussion of the fact that we've got more than 800 overseas military bases? Is there any discussion of the fact that U.S. Special Forces operated in approximately 143 countries last year? Is there any discussion of our arms sales and how dangerous they are around the world? Uh, the fact that the U.S. is bombing seven countries right now? You know, the, the real issues about what's going on are not being discussed. And, you know, we're, we're all very frustrated with the media. You can't get on mainstream media in the United States if you've got a, a if you're critical of American empire. There is no discussion of American empire. Well, they won't There's even they won't even of, say it. Let me go to Daniel. Finish off with you thirty seconds. It's forbidden to say American empire, but that's exactly what it is. Thirty seconds to you, my friend. Go ahead. Yeah, look what happened to Mark Lamont Hill on CNN, a critical voice uh, for Black liberation and for Palestine and. They give him the axe just because he dared to mention Palestinian self-determination. And I think it's always important with my students and with the general public to clarify that these are not our wars. We did not invade Iraq. The ruling class using our bodies and our limbs invaded Iraq for their benefit. But this is not our government, our system, our wars, so we have to oppose them. Okay, gentlemen, that's all the time. We've had fascinating discussion. We have to get the anti-war movement moving again. Many thanks to my guests in New York, Bethesda, and in Washington. And thanks to our viewers for watching us here at RT. See you next time, and remember, crosstalk rules.